and then that causing the internal uh, structures of the earth to uh, melt its connection to the crust and then the crust shifting in that event. Well, if you've ever dealt with a microwave, you know that microwaves are extremely hard to get accurate uh, heating based on depth density. And uh, there is some argument that for all the heat that microwaves produce, they do irreparable damage to the structure they're trying to heat. So I believe that this is the case. If the sun alone tried to help the earth get its crust into a new position purely by its fields, then it risks overcooking the earth and causing irreparable damage. Instead, what the sun needs is some external counterweight mechanism with sufficient magnetic pull that can aid in the process without destroying the crust. In other words, Elenin may well be here to help us avoid the catastrophic changes that the ruling elite seems so obsessed in. There is no indication to me, as I said, there's no indication to me at all that the sun that can destroy us any day it chooses has made up its mind to destroy us. And with that point, let me return to that article on the covenant of one heaven. Article 50, Treaty of the Sun. Because we're going to get through a fair bit tonight, and I want to talk about, as I say, some practical steps on the uh, steps of legal, and I want to cover the incredible updates that we're doing with the cognitive law. I'm not going to read the whole treaty here, because I do want to cover those other areas. But I want to make a number of points in raising it, and there's a reason why I'm showing this to you. The sun has been worshipped by many cultures over many, many millennia. The Egyptians and others clearly showed times where the sun was worshipped as its own deity. But there has never been in my recollection or in any events that I've seen, there has never been a conscious act of seeking a treaty with the sun whereby we offer an idea to the sun that is of immeasurable benefit to it. Let me explain what I mean by that. We were talking about comets before and saying that when a comet arrives, it carries with it a tail carrying enormous amounts of hydrogen. Now, comets in the past were seen as purveyors of doom because not only did they include the hydrogen, but they often included a swarm of meteorites at the back of the tail. And so when the comet travelled through, the meteorites, usually iron, saw the iron planet of Earth as a natural home. And of course, the shower of meteorites caused great havoc. Hence the worship of the black meteorite, Kybel, and the cornerstone of the Kaaba, still being a black meteorite in Mecca. But what comets show us when they react and the fact that the sun, being such a massive object, reacts to something as small, apparently as small as a comet, is that comets provide to the sun an enormously valuable assistance. If you want to view a comet, Think of it like going to a petrol station and a hose pump carrying hydrogen from the interstellar domain into the sun directly to its core. That's ultimately what a comet is. It's a carrier. It's a, not just a messenger, but a carrier of enormous amounts of hydrogen that then replenishes the hydrogen of the sun and allows the sun to... Uh, not feed on itself, not feed on its own reserves. Well, the Earth plays an important part because the Earth is the largest water object on the inner uh, areas of the sun and is extremely attractive to comets. 
if Mars had a moon of the same dimensions as the Earth's moon, then not only would the atmosphere compress on Mars, but it would in fact rain on Mars, and Mars and Earth would increase the attractiveness of comets to come to the Sun by a factor of eight or more. Now, if this was to occur, then our Sun would be fed from external hydrogen through the use of comets at least eight times or more than its present life. We would be bringing greater life to our Sun and helping our Sun. Now, this all sounds out there, I know, and to many people this uh, would sound like some fancy science fiction, but, but let, let me put it into context to you. One day ago, the sun ejected enough material that if it had been directed directly at the earth, would mean I would not be talking to you tonight. It would have knocked out a fair number of our communications. The sun has the ability, the absolute ability, to eject from itself sufficient material that if directed at us could fry our entire civilization in minutes. That is an absolute fact. It could do it at any second of any day. I'm not even talking about tidal waves or earthquakes. I'm just simply talking about our present technology could be wiped out in an instant by the sun at any second of any day. And this is a reminder of how powerful that sun is. But for all that power, the sun is also a conscious being. And for the first time in the history of our species, you are part of an idea where we come to the sun as conscious equals. Maybe not physically, but as conscious equals in a mutually beneficial agreement. This is one of the many, many miracles of the covenant of one heaven. And whilst there will be many who think this is some delusion, I assure you, from all that I know and all that I've seen and all that I've dreamt, that this agreement is well and truly known by the sun. And no matter what people tell you about Elenin, or what fears they tell you about the sun, or what the future may hold, because there will continue to be changes on this earth, everything is going to be okay. It's about how we use our powers wisely. Okay. Well, let's move on and let's talk about some practical things before we get into the cognitive law. Because if we're talking about powers, I want to talk about some of the powers of mind and the fact that the existing ruling elite absolutely depend on us to maintain their system. We are the visualizing and mind architects of their system. Most people won't spend the time to visualize a matrix. They won't spend the time to visualize a prison planet. They won't spend the time to visualize a new world order. We are making that reality. Not they, we are doing it. I want to talk about that, the power of the mind. But before we do, let's go through a, a laundry list of things that I think are important to remind ourselves, and we should do this on a regular basis because there are always new people coming and listening to this call, about some of the common mistakes we've been missing when we've been doing legal documents. So let me just cover that for the moment and then we'll get on to cognitive law. So the number of things that folks have been doing wrong that we've been picking up. And I apologize that those notes haven't yet come into being, but it's a matter of timing and, and limits of time. So here's the first. We've been throwing everything in the kitchen sink when we go to court. What do I mean by that? Well, 
we may have learned some material from Winston, Winston Trout. We may have learned some material from from others, from Tim Turner, from David Clarence, from, from a whole range of different people, and Eucadia. And so when we come to this, we feel the more is the better. Well, we haven't got the updated positive law there yet that incorporates the tools of logic. Let me remind all of ourselves something we spoke of previously, and that is that under the laws of logic, a lawyer, a judge, a prosecutor, a magistrate can look at your long list of documents ranging from all sorts of different places and only needs to pick one, only one idea on one document and prove that it is an absolute fallacy and then throw all of your documents, all of your arguments, all of your defence out the window. Now, how many of you have seen that happen or heard of that happening? I myself have heard of this happening over and over and over again. There is a general maxim. One case, one cause, one argument, one remedy. The key word is one, 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 one. In other words, you pick your strongest argument as your theme and you work within that. You don't collect a series of things that people have told you sound like good ideas and bundle them together, throw it against the wall and hope it sticks. That is a guaranteed method for failure. Guaranteed. Please think about it. One cause, one case, one charge, one argument, one remedy. Think about the strongest argument and then work from that position. And let's stop throwing everything in the kitchen sink. Here's another that we keep forgetting. Whether it be an ecclesiastical deed poll, which is a perfected claim of right. There is nothing deficient about an ecclesiastical deed poll. Now, I know a number of folks over time have said, well, you started one way, you changed it, and, and get concerned when they, they hear of change. Nothing that we have done from the beginning of introducing the ecclesiastical deed polls has been defective. If there's been any change, it is the fact that we have drawn to a close a period and a system and an argument and a right that has been around for a long, long, long time. And that when we issued to Benedict XVI, coming up to the day of illumination, Pentecost, which is actually going to be this Sunday, Sunday the 12th of June, just before an eclipse, a significant eclipse, signifying again that they are in dishonour. And they know it. That this is the age of the third, the end of an age of the age of Mithra, the end of the third age of Mithra, or the third Reich, the end of the third Reich of Mithra. Mithra. So the changes that we've done has been to reflect that this is an interaction. Nothing stays the same. It's not a weakness, but it is a recognition that the system as a whole can no longer claim blood right, can no longer claim blood as the most valuable commodity, currency, or signature, signing, sealing. But one of the things this system does have in every jurisdiction is that they have a mechanism to introduce in an administrative way documents into the court. And these are affidavits of fact, affidavits of evidence. The naming of them and the structure of them will depend upon where you are, whether it be one state, whether it be a different country. So I can't tell you the name that fits your particular country, your particular state, because it does different, different, uh, vary. What is important is, when you present a document, whether it be the importance of bringing an EDP into, ca into a case or the importance of bringing another document into case, remember these are private documents. 
a court is not going to immediately accept them.